Um, Patrick McCune's coming in in a second or two. He's the Breathing Gurus guru. He talks about, as does Matthew Walker, who's a good friend of his, uh, it's not just about quantity of sleep and it's not just about quality of sleep. It has to be quantity and mm. quality of sleep. Um, so... I wonder what he can do for us warming up before the mass from a breath point of view. How do we fire up our lungs? I bet there's a way to do it. Absolutely. Shall we find out? Well, he interviewed the guy that came first in the Barkley Marathons, the mad 100-mile race in Tennessee. And that person, because of Patrick McEwen, spent the whole time, 60 hours, breathing through his nose. Yeah, well, 60 seconds will do us. Mm. I mean, we'll take the 60 hours. Yep. All right, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see that for a 60-second warm-up. Coming up next on the show live. Chris Evans Breakfast Show. Do not miss this guy. Buy any car. Virgin Radio. Oh, my goodness me. It's one of those interviews where I might be too excited for the good of the interview, but never mind. Try and ignore me. i focus on the interviewee. I suppose the interviewer. Who might that be, Vassos? Our next guest is both a man in the know and a man in the nose. He's the multi-best-selling author who's also the breathing guru's guru. His book and training programme, The Oxygen Advantage, are both available now. So all hail the king of the inhale. It's Patrick McEwen. Oh, my drink. Here. Control room round of applause for Patrick, please. Screams. <laughs> Can I have some breathe mania? <laughs> How are you, Patrick? Good, Chris. I don't know what to do after that introduction. Thanks very much. <laughs> Patrick, give us uh, 60 seconds of stats of why we all have to nose breathe more and exclusively, if we can, from this moment on. Well, I suppose the mouth, there's nothing in it that's devoted to breathing. Your teeth, your tongue, your hard palate, your soft palate, your throat, none of those things do anything for breathing. So if nature designed the mouth for breathing, something in the mouth would be there for the breath. Yes, it's not. It's not. That says it all. <laughs> and, you know, an American doctor said back in the 1970s that the human nose has 30 functions. Yeah. And I couldn't find his list. So I put my own list together and it's 30. But it, there's even more. Yeah. So there's many, many functions in the human nose that we don't even give consideration to. Right. So you wouldn't eat through your nose. So why would you breathe through your mouth? That's exactly it. All right. So your yes. mouth is for kissing. Uh, it's for eating. It's for drinking. And it's for communicating. Right. And for smiling. Yes. Yeah. And befriending people, but not for breathing. No, definitely not. So why do we all do it? Why is it important that we don't, especially when we're asleep and for kids more than ever? You know, I think it's starting with children, it's so vitally important, Chris, and it gets no attention, unfortunately. You know, there was a study here of 11,000 children in Stratford-upon-Avon from age six months to 57 months. Children who were mouth breathing, snoring and stopping breathing, if untreated at five years of age, they had a 40% increased risk of special education needs by age eight. Now, that's published in the journal Paediatrics in 2012. The lead author is Karen Bonnock. So we're talking about brain development here. Yeah. And yet it's it's under the radar. So, you know, that's only one aspect of it. Of course, like when it comes to the main pillars of health, breathing does play a role. And the biggest one for me is state of mind. We all need that. You know, all of us are overthinking to a greater or lesser degree. And it's not just about mindfulness. We need to be able to change our physiology. And we can't have a calm state of mind with a gap between thoughts and control over our thinking unless we have good sleep quality and good breathing quality. Yesterday, I experienced very fortunately an extreme extremely calm two or three hour window i've been meditating for a bit sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't work um depending on what i'm doing afterwards where i am how the, how the meditation was anyway and um, my wife sent she dispatched me to go and get some all surface spray cleaner from sainsbury's at about 25 to 7 last night and i walked into sainsbury's and i just thought it's the most beautiful place in the world <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I didn't have a care in the world. I didn't have a thought in the world, but I was totally present because I was completely in my body. Yes. And this presence whereby our attention is simultaneously moving with time in the absence of thinking. Yeah. Thoughts appear, but we're not latched on to thought. We're not latched on and going down that train of thinking. Yeah. And I think it's tremendous, you know, because even coming into a situation, having a conversation with you, if I was to come in here with my attention all in my head, yeah. I would have been sabotaged before I walked in the door totally. but how many kids are going to do exams people are going to give presentations athletes are going out to, into competitive events and are not taught how to change states oh my goodness me and how you can help athletes how 
you have and how you want to, but you can't get through to them. I know that because you watch various athletes on the telly, don't you? And you think, I need to teach them how to nose breathe because they're already winning gold medals, but they could win even more. Um, and it goes from people who really should sort of know what they're doing to people who can be forgiven for not knowing what they're doing or what they're missing out on. Tell us about the, that lovely stat when people have to have their jaws wired together because they've had an operation and then their oxygen levels are measured because they can't not nose breathe. Tell us about that. So this was discovered by a researcher called Swift back in 1988 and um, it was an ear, nose and throat doctor, James Bartley, who really kind of put it on the radar. So these individuals were after having jaw surgery. So their jaws are wired shut. They had no other choice but to breathe through their nose and the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood increased by nearly 10%. Yeah just by continuous nasal breathing. But of course we don't breathe to get oxygen, we breathe primarily to get rid of carbon dioxide. We do. The driver to breathe is carbon dioxide. So when people feel that they're not getting enough air, that's not because there's a deprivation of oxygen, but it's due to an accumulation of carbon dioxide. And here's the thing. Some of us are more sensitive to the accumulation of carbon dioxide than others. And as a result, we will have a strong drive to breathe. We will tend to breathe faster, harder, We feel we're not getting enough air. We have disproportionate breathlessness during physical exercise. We breathe harder and faster during sleep. This increases turbulence in the upper airways. So there's snoring. There's lowering of blood oxygen saturation if the resistance to breathing is too much. So the biochemical dimension of breathing has been forgotten about. Most people talk about the biomechanical dimension, your yoga instructor, your Pilates instructor, your physiotherapist, your physical therapist. But who was talking about the biochemical dimension? For me, the pillar is... The foundation, nose breathing in and out, biochemical dimension of breathing, then the biomechanical, then the psychophysiological. That's the brain-body connection. That's the golden pyramid. Correct. All right. So we need to talk about um, mouth tape. We need to talk about nose strips. Uh, Again, we need to talk about breathing through your nose when you're asleep. So if you breathe with your mouth open, you block this big airway which is not a natural airway it's what we should swallow things via and that's a major issue because that gives us sleep apnea and we can stop breathing for between 60 seconds and two minutes even longer sometimes where we are not breathing at all because we're still asleep so our body's okay with that because it thinks we're safe but actually we are suffocating yes 936 million people on the planet have obstructive sleep apnea that's according to a lancet statistic back in 2017 25 to 50 percent of men something that really affects us as we get older women is about 10 percent under 50 years of age and it's about 30 percent post 50 post menopause and if we're having stopping of the breath during sleep to the point that our blood oxygen saturation is lowering we're continuously being aroused from deep sleep so we're not getting enough slow wave sleep this is when all the good stuff happens the brain cleans itself So it happens during slow wave sleep, during its glymphatic drainage. And if we're getting constant arousal from deep sleep to lighter sleep, and at the same time, we're being put into this increased stress response because we're stopping breathing. Now, I do breath holds during the day with a lot of the people that I work with. We mimic sleep apnea to some extent. We purposely hold the breath to drop the blood oxygen saturation down. A person could involuntarily stop breathing during sleep to lower their blood oxygen saturation down to 70 or 60 percent. Now, if you try that during wakefulness, you will have a hard time. But yet people are doing it during sleep and they're not even conscious of it. On an hourly basis, not even a nightly basis. Many times per hour. Oh, wow. All right. So we need to we need to if we can, if it's within our gift to ourselves, we should get some uh, mouth tape and we should get some nose strips. Yes. Now, there is a caveat there. There were papers to come out in 2022 and 2023 when they completely sealed people's mouths with moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea, their sleep apnea got worse. And the reason being is because it prevented the people from mouth puffing. Now, I think many wives have probably observed this with husbands or partners. So the person is snoring quite loudly and then they're out through the mouth. Yeah. So if you have to mouth puff, you have to mouth puff because the air has to leave the body some okay. way. So you can tape across the mouth. Right. Whatever device you use, it has to bring the lips together, but without actually covering the mouth. So this is the new mouth tape. With the, it's like a sort of polo. It has a hole yes, in the middle. Yes, correct. All right. That's now, a, that's you, a no, good you, you do You do sell these, don't you? But I mean, yes. he's not on peddling his wares. He just no. happens to know his stuff. And he, he, says, he said, nobody else is designing these. I need to get some out for kids, special stuff for yes. kids. See, here's a question for kids um, to do with kids. So, well, you know, most people can't get their kids to eat their greens. How can we get them to wear mouth tape and nose breathe at night? 
See, it's like it's it's really about. First of all, I think it's difficult for parents to work with their own kids. Yes, and always. <laughs> and the other yeah. thing is, you know, like. Of course, it's challenging working with children, but what's the alternative? Because I'm out, I was a mouth breathing child. Yeah. That's how I got into breathing. Yes. I have craniofacial abnormalities. I had terrible sleep. I couldn't concentrate in school. I'd ask my the stuffy nose, and it really affects your quality of life. Mm-hmm. But parents need to know this. So then it's worthwhile going down this route. And like we put all of the breathing exercises, they're all free. Yes. I taught my daughter, Lauren, about five years ago. She was nine years of age at the time. And we wanted to put out everything for free. And we have an app. Everything in it is free. You know, so there's no excuse for anybody who doesn't want to go down the breathing yeah, route. Yeah, and you're not trying to harvest people's emails and all that kind of nonsense, are no, you? No, God, no, no, we don't do that. But what I am saying is this. Can you imagine if every dental surgery had a poster on the wall about oral hygiene? In other words, dental health. It's not just about brushing your teeth. It's not just about eating less sugary foods. It's also about breathing in and out through your nose because if you have your mouth open for periods of time during the day and during sleep, it changes the bacteria in the mouth. You're more prone to gum disease, dental cavities and bad breath. Mm -hmm. So that's dental health. How about then going into a doctor's surgery and a child who's coming in with asthma and that child is coming in with a stuffy nose and the mouth open? Different exercises can be taught to that child to help decongest the nose and a strategy to change their breathing from nose, sorry, from mouth to nose breathing. Yeah. It doesn't happen. Now, how about the child um, who was obstructive sleep apnea and the gold standard of treatment is to remove their adenoids and tonsils it have, has an efficacy of 27% of children being cured. And if children are not taught nasal breathing, post adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy, they have a worsening in their sleep within three years. Yeah. But children are not being taught how to breathe through their nose. This should be in the education system. Of course it should. A hundred percent. A hundred percent it should be in the education system. All right. Uh, lots of people we know, because we talk about this kind of stuff a lot on our show, we know that if you if you do a high-intensity workout for a minimum of three minutes a week to a maximum of nine minutes a week, it can improve your well-being and extend your life by ridicul- ridiculously exponential amounts. Okay. Do you have the HIT workout equivalent of a nose and breathing exercise we can do every day yes so what i would say is any physical exercise you do with your mouth closed is tremendous right even if we just talk about a few of the benefits it will increase oxygen transfer from the lungs to the blood and the blood to the working muscles right it improves blood flow to the brain it increases oxygen delivery to the brain if you go for a jog with your mouth closed i would based on our calculations expect an increase of blood flow to the brain between 6 and 10%. Now, based on most people or many people do physical exercise to help with their mental health. Mm -hmm. But how about just switching, going a little bit slower at the start because the air hunger is that little bit stronger. And what you do is you continue breathing through your nose. Your body then adopts to nose breathing during physical exercise. This improves your breathing pattern so that you don't need as much ventilation during exercise, but you've got so many benefits And also, it reduces the risk of overtraining. You're protecting your teeth, you're protecting your mouth, you're protecting your airways. Like, it's you're activating the diaphragm. Mouth breathing just isn't where it's at. Now, when I I was coming here, I was coming here in a taxi and I was just looking out the window and I was saying, is London any different to to any other city? And I was just walking people, looking at people walking by. And I would say that 30 percent of people walking on the street this morning have their mouth open. Why? Yeah because it's easy and they're not thinking about it. But isn't this also evolution? I'm, I'm play, you know I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. I might be your biggest fan. So this is not what I think. But playing devil's advocate, isn't it evolution? Aren't we, isn't that just the way we're, we're going? Even though it's bad for us, like so are the, so many other things. I agree. It's, you know... So it, is it going to work if we fight against it or not? Well, I think we've no other choice, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, you could say evolution is that we're sitting down on desk Without for eight question. hours a day. Yeah, yeah. But we're, there's no, we might as well fight right, against so that. Right, so this is something we... We constantly have to do that is better for us to get up in the morning to do this even though the, our, the world that we've created is telling us to the opposite if we get out of the city and get into nature it's because you have this great thing about about um, all animals other than us and dogs nose breathe anyway yes yes newborn infants nasal breed yeah. a, a baby who is mouth breathing is really it's not good it's not a good sign for their health um, but all, lots of other, all other animals br- nose breathe pretty much when I was writing a book back in 2016 or was it before that I could only find three animals four animals they were diving birds gannets penguins pelicans and a dog right who were 
pers- they could switch to mouth breathing and it, it was a sign that, you know, they needed to do that. But animals, say, for example, who were going to breathe through their mouth, farm animals, they were sick. So say, for example, a cow who was breathing through the mouth is sick, a sheep, a horse who's breathing through the mouth is sick. Mm. So if we look at the entire animal world, there's only about a handful of animals who actually breathe in and out through their mouths. Yeah, I mean, one of the um, sort of counterintuitive thoughts that I have, I don't know if it's shared by other people, I'll share it with you because you're the man. Um, I used to think, because I've been on the nose breathing bus for many, many years, not as much as I want to be, and hopefully more today than yesterday and hopefully more tomorrow than today. But um, it was... my mouth gets dry at night. If I close my mouth, it's going to get drier. Of course, that's completely the opposite, isn't it? Correct. Really, what we want to have is we want to have the mouth closed during sleep and we want to have the tongue resting up in the roof of the mouth. Right. And the sleep quality is so, so much better. So earlier and on... the mouth won't be as dry. Correct. Because, of course, you know, like when you're breathing in through your nose, yeah. your nose is expen- <clears throat> expending an energy and moistening and warming the incoming air. Right. But when you breathe out through your nose, yeah. your nose recovers that heat and moisture. Right. Nature doesn't waste. Okay. No, I got it. I got it. And there is wastage in between um, more breaths per minute than less breaths per minute there's oxygen wastage what that lag in between the two see it's very interesting because when we talk about breathing people often hone in on breaths per minute which is the respiratory rate but that's only one part of the picture Uh i often describe it as if you were going to go for a meal somebody gives you a plate of food they give you a utensil could be a fork or it could be a spoon Mm. you have one consideration is the size of the fork And the other consideration is the number of forkfuls that you take into your mouth to consume the food on the plate. Okay, with breathing, the number of forkfuls is akin to the number of breaths, but the size of the breath is akin to the size of the fork. Now, really, if you were a dietitian and you were looking at food consumption, you wouldn't ask people how many forkfuls of food did you eat? What was the size of the fork? (laughs) You'd ask what was the volume of food you ate off the plate? But of course, with breathing, everybody is honing in on the respiratory rate and they're not looking at the tidal volume. They're not looking at minute ventilation. So it's really down to how much air do we breathe per minute? And many of us, I'm not going to say it's it's never 100 percent. It's very common for people to have a tendency to overbreed. And the thing about overbreathing is the more air you breed, the more your blood vessels constrict and the less oxygen that's delivered throughout the body. Right. So if you want to deprive your body of oxygen and deprive your brain of oxygen, breed more air. And a guy was at a, a, an interview with a radio station in Ireland called News Talk, and a, a listener sent in a question. And she said, When I do slow breathing, I get lightheaded. And I was just thinking, of course, this is going to be so common. She's slowing down the respiratory rate. She, she could be going from, say, 16, 18, 20 breaths per minute down to six breaths per minute. But she's already feeling air hunger. That's why she's breathing too fast. Now, as she starts to slow down the respiratory rate, she's feeling even more uncomfortable. So she takes disproportionately more air per breath. Mm. So it causes her to breathe even too much air, more air again. So we need to have a conversation It's not about the volume of air that you're taking into your lungs. It's really about the oxygen transfer from your lungs to your blood and your ability to use that oxygen. And with breathing, less is more. And that's why if you practice breath holding and and holding onto carbon dioxide or getting your body more comfortable to retaining more carbon dioxide for longer, it's more beneficial. Correct. And even just doing light breathing. So say one of the exercises, there were two exercises that got me into breathing, whatever, 25 years ago. One was I always had a stuffy nose. And one of the techniques that I was using back then was to breathe in and out through my nose, gently hold my nose and nod my head up and down, maybe for a count of 10 or 15 head nods. Because when you hold your breath, carbon dioxide accumulates in the lungs and blood, it activates a stress response, and the blood vessels in the nose, which are swollen or dilated, they constrict. So then that allowed me to switch to nasal breathing. Now, when I went from mouth to nose breathing, I was feeling uncomfortable, I was feeling suffocated, because I was going from breathing through a a bigger hole yep. to two smaller holes. Yep. So the, the carbon dioxide that was being produced in my body couldn't leave the body quickly enough. Yep. And as a result, it's accumulating in my lungs, it's accumulating in my blood, and I feel air hunger. But this is what I needed to sustain. Because the longer I expose myself to that slight accumulation of carbon dioxide, and it's not a high accumulation, the body is just so sensitive to this gas that even if it increases minimally, 
we feel air hunger. Yeah. But the more we expose ourselves to it, we develop a higher tolerance to the gas carbon dioxide and now our breathing becomes lighter and slower and comfortable. And we become more relaxed, relaxed in oh, the process. Oh, it's totally. That's the whole like, point. It's just win, 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 win. We just keep on winning, don't you, the whole way? If people fully understood what the breath can do for them, and I have to say, Chris, it has to go beyond what is being taught in yoga. Because for me, the yoga community have an enormous potential to expose and to really bring to their students the power of the breathing. They are not doing it. And I'm saying that and I don't mean to say that in a bad way. I just feel and I've seen there's something enormously powerful in this. And people are just scratching the surface. If you're teaching breathing exercises, you need to understand what's going on. Yeah. And the the reason you say that, I suppose, uh, I'm just guessing here, is because you've got a captive audience there. They they are so hungry for solving their air hunger. And the yoga teachers are so keen to do best by their students and therefore by themselves. And you're saying, listen, you're doing all the Hot, you, well you're doing so much heavy lifting but if you put these weights on these flavours of weights on the 5k on each end of this 100k they're more beneficial than what's on there in the first place correct if a yoga instructor tweaked with how they are teaching their breathing practice they would impart so much more oh, to their students right so how so obviously we can go onto the website oxygenadvantage.com what do yoga teachers do do they get in contact with you do they which books do they read there's been books around to do with breath work since 1870 you've got a favorite author what was that one called so there's one called shut your mouth that, and save your life yeah shut your mouth and save your life which sounds like it's brand new doesn't it in, in the self-development section of your bus, uh, bookshop that that is such a, self, a modern contemporary self-development title for a book and that was in 1870 it was and you know the story behind shut your us. mouth and save your life that's straight up <laughs> that's straight out of los angeles today isn't it sorry carry on so this was an american painter and he taught that the traditions in the american indians were dying out so he went and lived with them And one thing that he always noticed was that when the the native Indian baby had their mouth open, the mothers would go over and press the lips together. And it's it's pretty amazing, you know. So we knew this stuff. This Mm. just got lost. Just got dealt out of the game. And also you say um, for breath see breastfeeding, because breastfeeding not only obviously is is very good for for future grown up human beings, but it's also vicariously teaching you how to nose breathe. Correct. So breastfeeding is not just about nutrition right. for the baby, but it's also about manipulation of the muscles of the face necessary for the growth of that face. It takes effort for the baby to, to take the milk from the mother. And the only problem is with breastfeeding is that oftentimes tongue tie gets missed. So you can have an infant and their tongue is tied quite tightly to the floor of their mouth. The baby then isn't able to extrapolate the milk from the mother. The baby ends up chomping on the mother. The mother gets sore. The baby doesn't thrive. And then a bottle is introduced. In Brazil, every infant, their tongue is checked for tongue tie. And yet, even though it's prevalent in our societies, of course it is, it's getting overlooked. So babies and mothers who are having difficulty nursing, Mm. you know go to a specialist and ask the specialist just to check does the infant have a tongue tie and that tongue tie needs to be clipped this was done since the 16th century oh. there were midwives in France and I know it sounds like quite a little bit gruesome they had an extra long fingernail and if they noticed that the baby's tongue was tied that the frenulum the frenum they would clip it with their fingernail to allow the baby to be able to nurse. That's where it's... Oh, yeah. oh this is great, isn't it? Um, Andrew has WhatsApped us. The most asked question that we've been asked, I know one of the most asked questions you are asked is about the Wim Hof method, but you're also pre- asked about this one a lot. Um, it's to do with the nasal drip. Um, Vassas was talking about it beforehand. I have a really bad nasal drip and cannot breathe through my nose when I'm lying down and on a bad day, not even when I'm upright, I feel I would suffocate if I wired my mouth shut. Any advice... Yes. So what I would say is start doing breathing exercises to improve your breathing patterns, which will naturally help to open up the nose. The more you breathe through your nose, the better it works. Now, in terms of nasal drip, it is very important to get your mouth closed during sleep as well. And I would also say is do a nasal rinse. So get a good quality sea salt, something like Himalayan sea salt. You make one up. You do. That's what I do. Yeah, yeah. I just get boiled water, put in half a teaspoon of sea salt or even a quarter teaspoon of really good quality sea salt into the water. Add clean, cold water. Mm -hmm. Stick in your little finger so it's lukewarm. And then I just pour the solution into the palm of my hand, hold my nostril, snort it, bring it right down the back of the nose. Because we have to think that the nasal airway, the nose is not just this, what we see in the face. If we want to get an idea of the extent of the nose, put your tongue into the roof of your mouth, drag your tongue all the way along the roof of the mouth until you feel the soft palate. 
Yeah. The roof of your mouth is the floor of your nose. Wow. So sitting above your mouth is your nasal airway. Yeah. It occupies There's a, a lot of space. There's a in there. There's a whole <laughs> auditorium in there of air and, and salvation, isn't there? there so, is. so right, though. And that saline, that homemade saline solution, three times up each nostril to start with, longer if you like? Yeah, I would do it until the person feels, you know, just doing it a couple of times. And it's also very important because mouth breeders are very prone to bad breath. And the reason being is because there can be poor clearage. Yeah, yeah. So... It really about it's not just about getting the, the, the solution in one side of the nose and out the other it's about getting the solution into the nostrils down the back of the nose down the throat hocking it and spilling it out right. so do it in private we haven't done any protocols on air because uh, I don't want to take up time holding our breath and doing things like that when Patrick could be talking because it's all this is all these words are gold if you Patrick is on so many podcasts he's on so many YouTube clips um, he's got his own website which is all very very important oxygenadvantage.com loads of stuff on there for free loads of apps on there for free loads of protocols on there for free um, if we want to get better at holding our breath which is good for us we don't ho- hold our breath on the inhale do we? We hold our breath on the exhale. Can you just walk us through that if you don't mind? Yes. Now, the first thing I will say about breath holds, don't do it if you're pregnant yeah. or if you have anxiety or panic disorder, because when we do a breath hold, it generates a fear. It's a primal fear, that feeling of air hunger. And it can be very good to give somebody who is prone to panic disorder and anxiety a controlled dose of air hunger because it desensitizes them to the fear of suffocation. But you have to go careful. So breath holding is more of a stress or exercise. And any time we do stress or exercises, we have to tailor them according to the individual. Now, I would just kind of backtrack slightly because we touched on one breathing exercise, but we never really went through it. I would like people in the comfort of their home this evening, when they're maybe watching sitting tea, when it's wa- safe, sitting safe down, to do so. watching television, yeah. just put one hand on their chest, one hand just above their navel, allow their shoulders to relax, tune into their breathing, and really slow down the so- slow down the speed of the air coming into the nose, almost that the breath in is imperceptible. So you're really having a soft and slow, gentle breath in through your nose and a really relaxed and a slow and a gentle breath out. And the purpose of this is to slow down and reduce the volume of air that you are breathing to the point of air hunger. Now, this is about improving CO2 tolerance, which is more applicable to everybody. Breath holding should be done by some, but not by everybody. So with this, you're just gently softening and slowing down the speed of your breathing. By breathing less air, carbon dioxide increases slightly in your lungs and blood, so you feel air hunger. Now, this is about getting the air hunger right. Not too little, not too much, just right. When we get it just right, in other words, that you're feeling air hunger, but it's tolerable. You can you can cope with it. You will notice that you will have increased watery saliva in the mouth. You feel sleepy and your blood circulation improves. Now, this was the second exercise to get me into breathing. This exercise is my go to exercise. Like I use about 25, 26 different tools, but this is my most. This is by far and away the best one. When do you do this? I will do this even sitting in the green room earlier on. Ready to come in? Yes, because any time that I feel that if I'm going into, say, a challenging situation and if I find like notice... This one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. If I notice that my heart rate is increasing slightly, yeah, yeah. well, I want my body to tell the brain that I'm safe. Yeah. So I take a soft breath in through my nose and a really relaxed and slow, gentle breath out. And by having that slow and relaxed, gentle breath out, and the thing is, there's nothing for anybody to see. So I can be just sitting there. I can be doing it. I can be in the most hostile or challenging situation. But in that situation, I can be telling my brain that I am safe. I don't want my body to go into faster and harder breathing because then my brain interprets that my body is under threat. And my brain is here to protect me. Our brains are here to protect the body. So if the brain interprets the body as under threat, the brain wants you to get out of the situation. So this is why when people have a challenging situation, they often feel that they cannot think straight. And the reason being is because they go into slightly faster and harder breathing, their brain interprets their body is under threat, and their brain wants them to get out of the situation. So many questions for you. We don't have time for any of the questions uh, from the listeners, but what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll give them to Patrick now, and then we'll sort of have a resume on the air tomorrow. Is that all right, Uh You've been amazing, mate. You didn't disappoint. Also, a couple of things. Um, if you want to get rid of middle-aged spread, uh, not so much the big stuff, but the small stuff. So if you're doing all the right things, and you still have a bit of a belly um that is a stress belly and so this will help you get rid of that 
um but it will also help you become better looking won't it well in terms of you know better sleep yeah better state of mind yeah. i think i think but a better jawline doesn't that help that is correct yeah now i'm I think mine has changed over the years. People have said it to I, me. I agree. I've, I, I didn't want to. I mean, why would I ever say that to you? But now you give me permission. I've seen very early videos of you, and you are yes. unrecognisable now. <laughs> I think it has changed. Now, this is where the science has yet to catch on yeah. because normally we will say that 60% of the growth of the face is achieved by four years of age, uh -huh. 90% by age 12. Mm. So therefore, we shouldn't get a change in our shape, the shape of the face after that age. Mm. OK, the human face is growing up until about age 18, but I'm 50. Yeah. You know, so why can it change? You look younger now than on the first videos I've seen you, <laughs> which is 20 odd years ago. They are going back a long, long time. Yeah. Yes, it's great to see you, Patrick. Is there anything Chris. that we haven't touched? We got like thirty seconds. Anything I would you want to say, say? Listen to anybody who thinks about breathing. If it's a little bit not for you, it absolutely is. If you want to have a better quality of life, think about. All your right, breathing. and if people jump onto your website, there's loads of stuff there, and they've got five minutes. What should they look at? Um, there's lots of free videos there. You know, I think the best thing would be to download the Oxygen Advantage app. I prop put pretty much everything into it all free it's all free love it you're you're a godsend is what you are i'm trying to get it out there mate you're a br you're brilliant and people can learn to be teachers with you can't they yes we have teachers in 50 countries i'd love to take that course i'd like to do well that. we will offer you a free complimentary mate, place. no i'm happy to pay <laughs> i'll pay for me and some others don't worry about that it's great to meet you man thank you so much Patrick Chris. what a hero can we please have a control room round of applause this man is here for the benefit of the human race he's the best isn't he